Isn't the love of Jesus wonderful? Yeah. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the love of Jesus in your life. And the title of this message is, I Want More of Jesus. And I want to talk to you about somebody who, in most circles, would have been a complete loss, a complete loser, somebody who most people wouldn't have given any hope for. Come with me to Luke chapter 8, because this person who was hopelessly messed up became a minister of the gospel, and was not just a minister of the gospel, but well received by Jesus and his disciples. So we look to Luke chapter 8 and verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve, that is the twelve disciples, were with him, and also some women, would you say some women? Who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, who was the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. And these women were helping to support them out of their own means while a large crowd was gathering. The people were coming to Jesus. Let's pray. I want to talk to you about Mary Magdalene. Lord, we open our hearts because there's none too far away, too lost, and too filled with sin, or too smothered with demonic oppression that you cannot set them free and make them part of the family of God. So today, we ask that, Lord, you would minister to your people in this place and to our neighbors that they might see and we might walk in the goodness and the fullness that you have for us. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want more of Jesus. And you know, this is the story of Mary Magdalene. My mother's name was Magdalene. And there is a town, when you come with us to Israel, there is a town that we will drive past called Magdal. And it is on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. You know, Jesus spent his ministry time, most of it, around the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, 75% of all of his miracles took place within a five-mile radius from Capernaum. And it's not too far from there where Mary Magdalene come from. She was a sinful lady. She was somebody who was sexually promiscuous. And you know, there's more than AIDS that you can get from having sex outside of marriage. There's such a thing called the transference of demons. I have seen some people who in their youth were joyful young ladies full of life and full of strength and full of gifting and talent who as they became older teenagers and went into their early 20s they became so promiscuous that they became demonized and it was like the demons from all of their partners ended up inside of them and this woman that I'm thinking of although I know of several ended up in a mental institution, could barely remember her own name, and was so tormented that they had to keep her under drugs in order for her to even be somewhat stable. It is a terrible thing when somebody is in a place where the devil has taken advantage of them. There's a reason why people sin. There's a reason why lives get broken down and why the enemy the devil comes and torments people 
and pulls them into a place of, he's, he's come to kill and to steal and to destroy. And the only answer is not a psychiatrist. It is not a counselor. It is not drugs. It is not opioids. It is not some kind of painkiller or some kind of drug that will make you numb. It is, uh, you know, a counselor. He can get you talking about something and he can go back into your past and figure out why you got to be the way you are with the struggles that you have. But unless he knows Jesus Christ, he cannot give you the remedy. He can only tell you more about the problem and he can give you something that will help you to survive. He can give you something that will numb your senses or uh, help you to disassociate so that you're a survivor, but there will be something inside of you that will be forever frozen because only Jesus is the one that sets the captives free. Only he is the one who breaks the power of the tormentor. Only he is the one who restores the years that the locusts have eaten. He is the king of kings. He is the creator of life. He is the one that can resurrect the dead. He is the one that brings hope Hope to the hopeless and strength to the weak. He is the one who brings life when there is no longer any life. When one person feels all forsaken by everybody else, including the condemnation of their own hearts, there is one who can lift you up and give you dignity again and give you honor and nobility and make you into the person that you eternally have been called to be. And his name is Jesus. Mary Magdalene was this woman who had seven demons cast out of her. We read more about her in Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. It says, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And when a woman who had lived a sinful life, say lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, is if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus, he knew his heart. He knew what he was thinking. Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. He said, two men owned money to a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50 denarii. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon says, I suppose, the one who had the bigger debt. You judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman, and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus looked to this woman, Mary Magdalene, and said, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that he even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the beginnings of a wrecked life that's going to turn around 
to the glory of God. It's no wonder that she couldn't stay away from Jesus. It's no wonder that she loved him. She was the scorned. Everybody in the whole village knew that this woman was a sinner and not a casual one. She was overboard sinner so that everybody knew that she had lived a life of sin, promiscuity, and darkness. Sometimes when somebody lives a life like that, they even give up on themselves. And they say, there's no, there's no hope for me. They might try some casual ways to stop what they know is destroying them, but the next day they return to it. And they feel trapped and they feel hopeless. But Jesus comes to set the captives free. And he has set you free. He is the one who set you free from whatever captivity that you have been in. And that is the beginning of the journey. Hey, you might not have been like this woman. Maybe you've been worse. I don't know. But you know and Jesus knows. But every person needs to be set free. Regardless of little or great sins that you have committed and walked in. And the stuff that has come down upon you from others, perhaps generationally. For you to walk in the light and love of the Lord means that somebody's got to open the prison doors. Somebody's got to get you out. And somebody's got to set you free. And he doesn't just do it for Mary Magdalene, this hero in the Bible. He's done it for you as well. It's your starting place. It's, and you should have this love for him. I want more of Jesus. So the first thing I'm going to give you four different words today. They all start with the letter F and the first one is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's exactly right. And so Jesus has come. For freedom he has set you free. You know that? He wants you to fly like a bird. He, he wants you out of your cage. He wants you to be a daughter of nobility, a son of extraordinary dignity. He wants you to fly. He wants you to roar like the lion. He wants you to go in the lion's den and close their mouths and set the captives free who are there. He is your freedom. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is the first thing that a real Christian needs to learn. That once you come to Christ, you have to learn the truth. Because if you don't know the truth, you will forever be a victim. If you don't know the truth that sets the captives free, you'll forever come under that place of abuse. There will be an attack against you that will be nonstop, continual, and it won't lift. If the devil knows that he can grab you around the throat and he can wreck you by pulling you this way and that way until your hair looks a mess and your eyes are blurred and you have no joy in your heart anymore, then that's what the devil will do until you learn the truth that Jesus has come to set you free. And in that name, you will be free. If you know how to proclaim and how to take your stand and how to walk with the Lord in the goodness of the Lord, you will be free. Like this woman, Mary Magdalene. Now, let me ask you a question. If you or somebody you know had a real messed up life, and the church community knew about it too. Will they receive you? Will they always look at you sideways? Will they always say, a leopard cannot change their spots? I want you to know that Jesus is the one who gives us the example. For we read in the scripture that we opened with that there were women who traveled with Jesus 
In Acts chapter 8, it says, The twelve were with him, and there were also some women, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. So here's Jesus, and he has received this lady. You know, there were some people who wanted to travel with Jesus, and he said, no, go back to your village. But Mary Magdalene was welcome to become part of the team. You know, the honor it is, and I want you to know, it doesn't matter where you've come from, but if your eyes are set on the Lord, and if you want to go forward, and if you give everything to the Lord, regardless of where you've come from, you can be part of this team. This is the family of God. Yeah. In fact, if any of our leaders look down their nose with disgust or disdain towards somebody who's climbing up out of the pit because they're still dirty. That leader will hear words from me. Because the second word that you need to understand that this lady entered into starts also with the letter F and it's the word fellowship. Do you know that that's what you've been called to? You know what you've been called out of, the sin that so easily besets you and the darkness of this present world. But what have you been called into? The Bible tells us that you've been called into the fellowship of God's dear son. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you were not a family, but you are now the family of God. And furthermore, you don't have to be perfect. In fact, I don't expect that you will be. If you are, please tell me how you did it. But fellowship is important. You need to learn from Mary Magdalene that just because her own heart condemned her and everybody else in the village condemned her, she recognized that Jesus, and after they had learned, the disciples didn't reject her, and nor did the sisters that walked with Jesus, who had become disciples as well. They didn't reject her, and she found a place. She found a place of safety. She found a place of growth. She found a place of commonality and fellowship, the interaction of the saints. So I want to know, how about the fellowship that you're in? And if you really have it, maybe you're pretty confident and self-reliant. Some of you are supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> but that doesn't mean everybody is. And sometimes, you need the fellowship for the sake of others and not just for the sake of yourself. And that's why you shouldn't forsake the meeting of your, the gathering of yourself together with the people of God. Because somebody needs you. Somebody who doesn't have your strength. Somebody who's limping. Somebody who's wounded. Somebody who's felt like they have no family and nobody in this world cares. And they're right here in this house. It's time the people of God quit being selfish and started to understand what it means to bear one another's burdens and to love on people till they smile again. To love on people till they love again. And to love on people till they give and receive again. Until all that is frozen becomes thawed. And people live the life that God has promised them and paid for and given them. And they can't do it without the fellowship of the saints. And brothers and sisters, that is our responsibility. And somehow... Somehow, when Jesus said to his disciples, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, they cast that net out and they brought in Mary Magdalene. 
Whoa. Let the healing just come right now into your heart. You need to know that you are loved. You are. And you ought to press in. And if you're having a hard time doing it, because some of us don't know how to speak without messing it up. Yeah. God's been convicting me of late about my own speech to people that sometimes even in jest or joke can actually leave a little hurt on somebody that you didn't expect it to. Oh, family of God, may God help us to understand this word of fellowship and bring in the Mary Magdalene's, not just keep her in the back room, but let her be right up front and center in the middle of the crowd, standing beside Jesus and the disciples, also serving, also ministering, also giving, also praying, and setting other captives free. Who can do it better? It takes one to know one. So, Mary Magdalene found freedom and she found fellowship. And what is it when you start to get into freedom and fellowship? You're going to find something that starts with the letter F. And it's the third thing I want to tell you about, and it's fullness. Yeah. And this is your journey in the Lord. It doesn't matter how bad it was, but there is a place of fullness for you because you see... In John chapter 1, we read about this. In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. This is John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And we know that's Jesus. And the Word was with God. And then we read down in verse 4. 1 John 1, 4, it says, In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The life of God is what lights us up. It's what shows us the path. It's what helps us to understand. It, gives, it illuminates the world and, and everything that is good and wonderful. And Jesus is the word of God that his light comes. His life brings that light. And then we read on in verse 14. And it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, Jesus and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And of his grace we have all received, grace for grace, grace in place of grace. So let me tell you about this thing of fullness. So how many of you have been set free? You understand this word freedom. Just lift your hand up and wave it to me. Whom the Lord has set free is free indeed. And how many of you understand fellowship? Let me see. All right. Now do it. The third thing is fullness. See, you need to fill your tank up with the grace of God. The devil's going to throw some junk at you. Yeah, he is. He's going to discourage you. He wants you in depression. He wants you with a face that's dragging on the ground behind the bus. He wants you to look like a birch broom in a fit. He wants you to be a mess. He doesn't want you to be somebody who's full of life, who's got the joy of the Lord. He doesn't want you to have peace. He doesn't want any of that for you. But the Lord has come. He says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And this is the fullness that you have. The fullness comes because you're free and because you're in the fellowship. But then you've got to fill up your tank. How are you going to do that? You have to learn to worship. You've got to learn to pray. You've got to learn to proclaim the word of the Lord and make a good confession. You have to learn to walk in the service and the ways of the Lord. And it's that fellowship 
with him and with one another that will make your joy complete and that will bring you fullness you should be full you should be like you just ate a meal that was more than you should have eaten and you feel like you need a nap because you had such a meal you were at grandma's house on Sunday afternoon and it was Thanksgiving and there were so many things and you wanted to have a little bit of everything and 15 minutes after you had a little bit of everything you said I can't believe I ate the whole thing but that's how it should be with you and Jesus it should be like that it should be this meal that fills you up and fills you up of his fullness you shouldn't be an empty person you shouldn't be a sad person you shouldn't be a fearful person you shouldn't be a worry wart you shouldn't be a gossiper you shouldn't be somebody who's always frustrated but you should be full with the grace and the goodness of the Lord so it oozes out of your pores and spills out to everyone you meet so that you have a spirit of encouragement and a life-giving flow a river that goes down the people of his fullness you have received the grace of God the tanked up filled grace of God in your life are you there now what happens when your tank is full and you kept it full for a long time I'll tell you what God's gonna give you a bigger tank <laughs> once you do well with what you got he's gonna mess you up <laughs> yes he is because of the increase in his kingdom there will be no end and you need to be more than just happy you need to be more than just filled with his goodness he wants to give you a bigger tank yeah and when you get a bigger tank some of it's going to be empty some of you have come to a place in your life where you lived with a full tank for a long time but something happened and you can't quite figure it out because something's missing I want you to know God's given you a bigger tank and you know you have to fill that bigger tank and to fill the bigger tank is more work than filling the little tank yeah so some of you might have the name little tank <laughs> but the Lord wants to give you a new name big tank oh yeah and he wants you to learn how to fill the big tank yeah with his goodness and his power and his authority so that you're you're unstoppable you're such an overcomer and you're such a powerful minister for the gospel and the goodness of the Lord you're absolutely radiant and absolutely magnificent that's the call of God on your life <laughs> how many want to trade in the little tank for a big tank if you do you're in for some trouble yeah you have to learn what it means you're gonna need bigger axles to carry the bigger tank you're gonna need bigger torque in your engine yeah you're going to need a higher octane in your fuel you got a bigger tank you need a bigger truck Are you still with me see Mary Magdalene she wouldn't be separated from the Lord she just couldn't understand how this Messiah this rabbi could love her when she didn't even love herself and she gladly spent her life savings and poured it over his head with that perfume and cried and wiped his feet and kissed his feet and wiped them with her hair and then she huh, I'll tell you something if I were Jesus and I needed a bodyguard I'd pick Mary Magdalene <laughs> you try to hurt my Lord I'll give you five <laughs> yeah
Well, there's something more than freedom and fellowship and fullness. It's fruitfulness. You know, you weren't made just to be happy and full and complete in yourself. You're made to serve. This is going to take some work, especially for modern Americans, especially I don't want to get myself in trouble. <laughs> I pulled that one back. Come with me to the book of John. We're on our last point. And uh, remember I told you that the Lord was helping me with my tongue? Some of you saying, well, he needs to do more work. Speed it up, Lord. John chapter 19, verse 25 Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. She's there at the cross, tears streaming down her face. I want more of Jesus. Jesus, don't leave me. I can't make it without you. The Bible says that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea took down the body of Jesus after he had died. And they took him and put him in a tomb that was close by in the vineyard, in the garden, right there. And then the big stone was rolled in front of it and it says, and Mary... Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were there and they watched the stone rolled in front of the tomb. And then we read in John chapter 20, it says, Early the first day of the week, while it was still dark, guess who went to the tomb? Mary Magdalene, heartbroken devastated and they went Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance and in verse 10 then the disciples went back to their homes but Mary stood outside the tomb crying Mary Magdalene said I want more of Jesus but now he's gone now his body is gone from the tomb. And she's crying. And as she wept, little special effects there. Thank you. I like a little more special effects from the congregation from time to time. I'm trying to get this to become more of a black church so that I can get some activity. Some sweet as a peach, honey, or... When I get meddling, you can say, move them on, Lord, move them on. <laughs> yeah, a little child will lead them. But as Mary stood outside the tomb crying, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels, Mary Magdalene. And they asked her, woman, this is verse 13, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Probably saw his feet. And her eyes were all blurry from crying. She didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And then Jesus spoke to her. And he said, woman, why are you crying? Who is it? you're looking for and she thinking that it was the gardener said sir if you carry him away tell me where you have put him and I will get him and then Jesus spoke her name he said Mary and she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic Rabboni which means teacher 
And Jesus said, don't hold on to me, for I've not yet returned to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. Later on, it says that after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene and then to Peter and the others. This woman, who is a complete mess, completely lost in hopelessness and sin, a wreck, finds freedom because of Jesus. She finds fellowship and acceptance because of Jesus. She finds fullness because of Jesus. And you know what? She becomes so fruitful because she's tried and tested. If you want to be a fruitful person to bring about ministry, the purposes of God, the eternal purposes of God, you're going to need to be faithful. You're going to need to say, I want more of Jesus. It's not about me. It's about him. And you're going to have to be there in the times of difficulty. When it doesn't look good. Like Mary was at the cross. She saw them put him in the tomb and close the door. Roll the stone there. And she came back and saw an empty tomb. Where do you think she was on the day of Pentecost? <laughs> Where do you think she was when the ascension took place on the Mount of Olives and Jesus was lifted up? I wonder if he walked over to her before the angels took him and he ascended into heaven and he just put his hand on her. And he says, wait in Jerusalem, Mary. The promise of the Father is coming and you shall receive power you shall receive power and you shall be my witness here in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the far corners of the world Do you want more of Jesus? To the best of your ability, don't let him out of your sight. Run to his feet. Pour adoration and love upon him. You know, all the wrongs that are done to you and all the injustice and all the shame, self-caused and some put on you by others, doesn't amount to a hill of beans. If you have Jesus, if you have Jesus, you have everything. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Isn't the love of Jesus something powerful? So now, this is your inheritance. This is your journey. Give him everything and watch how he blesses you over and abundantly over beyond what you can think or dream. Will you stand to your feet now? I feel the power of the Holy Spirit here today and a call of God for you to fall in love with Jesus again. Because there's no one like him. If you're messed up, he's going to unmess you. If you're bound, he's going to set you free. If you're in prison, he's going to let you get out. Take you out. Take you by the hand. And then he's going to demolish the prison behind you. And then he's going to bring you into the fellowship of the saints. And the fellowship with him. That's why you have to worship. Just because you got saved, that's not the end of the story. You just walked in the door. My goodness. 
If you think you understand it, you don't. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. The more you experience, the more there will be to experience in God. And then he'll give you fellowship, and then he will give you fullness. This is where you should live. This is your mainstay. This is the life of the believer. It's full with the grace of God. You should be in love with everything except the devil. Even if you're not a cat lover, love the cat. Yeah. You love a tree. Yeah. And especially the people of God, his angels, and love him more than anything else. Love your family, love your kids, and love your neighbors. And be full. And then be fruitful. But to be fruitful means testing and trials. You have to be faithful and endure. Now hold your hands out in front, please. And would you pray this prayer? You can do that. Come on. Yeah. Get out of the box. That's it. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to do what you're doing now. Say this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me Jesus. I want more of Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me walk with you in the intimate places, in the deep places, in the purposeful places. I give you my life. Help me with my journey now. Release faith into me. And let me be a minister of the gospel. I receive your empowerment in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come on up to the front. And if you would like added prayer, you come and let these folk pray for you. And now I'm going to bless you. And put your hand on your heart. You don't need to repeat. I'm going to speak the blessing of the Lord over your life now. In the name of Jesus, I open up every place inside of you. And I stand with you for all of God's goodness and his kindness and his mercy to come upon you. I break off every attack of witchcraft, every curse over your life. And I speak the blessing of the Lord over you, the peace of God in your home. I speak the joy of the Lord in your heart. I bless you with the blessings promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I bless your marriage. And I bless your children and your children's children. And I speak strength and fruitfulness and the day of God's favor over you. I speak it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And God bless you.